All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and kick off our uh, session here. And uh, thank you for the enthusiasm uh, and the line, I think, uh, from a food perspective. Hopefully, we'll have enough for everybody. Um, but we're really excited to have everybody here today. And I think, you know, fortunately, I'm amongst friends here on this panel uh, in this conversation. But what we really want to talk about today is, I think, is really a different technology than what we've talked about a lot of times in the tavern space. We're not looking at just replacing the valve, but really restoring the native valve. And so I'm Chris Maduri, and I'm going to really kick off this session today. But the goal today is to really give you a better understanding of Duravar, which, again, is a new class of TAVR, a valve that's really designed to restore native flow. All right. Let's get this moving here. Can we put the slides up, please? Yeah. Perfect. So I'm Chris Maduri. I'm at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm also the uh, CMO at Antares Technologies. So I think really to start the conversation, we have to go backwards because we have to ask ourselves, what have we been doing for the last 15 to 20 years? And to be honest, the goals, and when you look around the other tavern devices that are being developed, the target has been, how do we make a better version of a bioprosthetic valve? And personally, as we started this quite a few years ago, we asked ourselves a different question. How do we actually design a valve that actually instead mimics the native valve instead of actually trying to mimic a bioprosthetic valve? And I think that's fundamentally the difference you're going to see here today as we look forward and we see all the initial results with this technology. So I, for some important background, this wasn't just kind of a convoluted idea by a bunch of friends. This was actually built off of a, a, a company, Antares, that has a long history of the development of bioprosthetic or, bi uh, or tissue technology. So this cutting edge tissue technology has actually been around since 2014 being FDA approved and has been used in over 55,000 patients now globally in the cardiac space and as well as a vascular patch. And it's been clinically proven to be calcium free up to 10 years. And there's a long, long source of literature that really supports this conversation. Now, I think that's important because if we're going to talk about building a backbone of trying to mimic a native valve, we want to make sure we have the right platform to be able to do that. And so first, Antares, who had been selling this tissue for a while, asked themselves, listen, what is another space we could be moving into? There seems to be a lot of opportunity in the tavern space. But again, the question was not how do we make another bioprosthetic valve, is what is the unmet need in the tavern space? How do we ask ourselves different questions? And that question really was, well, if we're going to go after a new target, what does a healthy aortic valve perform like? And then after that, we ask ourselves, okay, if this is what it performs like, and we've now established those benchmarks, how do we actually try to mimic that valve? Then we have to put it on a stent. And lastly, we have to actually be able to deliver it pretty effectively. So that wasn't just done now. I think those are important questions, but they weren't done in a silo by a group of engineers and some people in industry. It was actually done by a company that said, you know what, these are important ideas, but we actually want to engage the key leaders in the, globally and ask them how to actually find the unmet needs and how to actually build them. So at that point, some of which are on the podium today, including myself, were initially engaged and asked that question, what are the unmet needs in the TAVR space? What are the compromises? What are younger patients need? And to be honest, it took us a few years to get there. I mean, we had a lot of times we were looking at designs and trying to sort this out, and it was a struggle. But eventually, we think we landed on the sweet spot that you'll see today really is transformative. And what we identified was that if we wanted to mimic the native aortic valve, we couldn't do the same thing everybody else does. We couldn't take a piece of tissue and cut it into three pieces, sew it onto a stent, and try to mimic the bioprosthetic valves that exist today. We have to look at it differently. How do we mimic what a healthy valve looks like? The only way that's done is by taking that single piece of tissue, just like the body's valve itself is, and molding it to the shape of the native aortic valve. And that, hence, allows us to actually have native, healthy-like performance. Now, we said all that was important. Well, of course, we have already mentioned the backbone is having an incredibly durable tissue with these important anti-calcification and the fibrotic tissue properties. But the design of valve that also reduced, had long coaptation length, reduced stress. There was balloon expandable because it was felt to be important at the time that people wanted an easy-to-use valve. The struggle was we were trading off and we were using an easy-to-use valve because it was a compromise in hemodynamic performance. We also wanted to be able to have commissure alignment as well as coronary access. So building on that then, we took this adapt tissue and molded. Now I think it's important to understand, well, why haven't other people done this? Why is it not, you know, people thought of it this way? Well, it's important to understand that this unique adapt tissue process 
allows this tissue to be molded. You cannot just take a normal bioprosthetic, you know, bovine pericardial tissue and go mold it into this shape. You have to have the unique securely IB based properties of this tissue to actually provide this unique shape. And I think it's important to recognize what this tissue actually has in it. This tissue has undetectable levels of, of, of free aldehydes, which is a big driver in the calcification process. But additionally, you find no alpha-gal, no DNA or RNA remnants, and no phospholipids. And again, these are all part of that inflammatory response that contributes to degeneration. Now, that's great. You have a great tissue. You've molded it. But I think it's important to understand that by building this biomimetic design of it, again, it really does normalize flow and reduce leaflet stress. And what you can see here is that unlike a bioprosthetic valve that typically has a couple millimeter coaptation length at best, what you see is this incredibly long coaptation length. And what that allows this valve to do, and Mike will talk about it a little bit more, is it allows you to avoid any pinwheeling and additionally significantly reduces leaflet stress. I think these are all, again, key components to durability. And you can see this here. This valve, as it open and closes, is really what you want a surgical aortic valve repair to look like when it open and closes. This is what you want a healthy aortic valve to look like. As I already mentioned, and Sushil will get into more, it is an incredibly to use, easy to use, balloon examinable system. This valve is in and out of the body within a few minutes of putting it in through the sheath. It's that easy and intuitive to use. It's a very robust 14 French expandable sheath system. And again, Sushil will get to that a little bit more. But I think lastly, what I want to touch on before I pass this off to my friends and colleagues here is, you know, sorry, we built a valve and you'll see the hemodynamics are really unparalleled clinically as well. Um, but what we think is also important is not just how wide it opens, but how it opens. And this is something that hasn't often been looked about in the field, but I think it's going to be a really important topic in the near future. And that's the word we use, kinematics of the leaflet. So how does it actually open? And if you actually watch here in slow motion, what you'll see is this. <clears throat> so in a traditional three-piece valve, as it opens, it really hinges like a door. So it is three different leaflets, and they essentially are swinging open and closed like this. Conversely, when you watch how this Durvar is built, it allows you to, to build native-like flow in because you end up puffing, as you can see in the, the Duravar leaflets in the middle here, and then popping open. So there's not this turbulent flow that's coming out here and there. So as you watch this move slowly, you can see that this just goes from puffing to popping open versus this kind of door opening appearance in the other ones. So I'll let it play one more time, but I think you can appreciate here that there's a distinct differences in the leaflet kinematics to allow you to have a more native-like valve function. So in summary, you know, we can talk about a lot of things here, but I think what's important to understand is this valve with an incredible history of tissue technology with the company was built not to make another bioprosthetic valve, but it was built to mimic the native valve, which is what could be a better target when we're talking about best possible therapies for our patients. It is made not just by a group of engineers, but you'll see about the intuitiveness of it, and you'll hear in our conversation today, this was physicians who we talk weekly or every other week with engineers embedded this to figure out what do users need to get the right results. And it has an incredible coaptation length as well as the tissue technology we think will provide benefits from a durability perspective acutely and long-term and opens and closes differently than other valves. Thank you. All right, shall we uh, start with uh, some of the discussion maybe? Um, Basically, you, you introduced new terminology. You mentioned this uh, biomimetic valve. Um, Michael, is this truly a different class of valve technology, or is this more of the same? What is your opinion on that? I think this is a, a, a different valve design. I mean, you know, when we look at our valves and we wonder how they're going to work, how long they'll work, we, we look at valve design and tissue science. And, and this has really incorporated both of those. One, the valve design using a single molded piece with fairly high commissures, which allows it to spread the stress across the leaflet. Um, it, it's going to leave. It's going to lead to a better, not a better opening, but a better closing force. And it's also going to lead to better valve durability. I think. So I think. I think this is something that's completely different. I mean, we know that at least in the world of surgery, there's only one operation for aortic stenosis that gets you back to a normal lifespan, and that's the ROS, because I give you a normal valve. And so the closer I can mimic an aortic valve, the more biomimetic you become, the longer the valve is going to last. And, and I think that this will translate into clinical outcomes, which we've seen, I think, in other trials based on hemodynamics and durability. Yeah, great point. 
Because yeah, no, I, I wasn't really going to ask a question to Vinny because I always learn so much about surgical valves and so on from Vinny. So Vinny, you know, up until maybe a year, yeah, two years ago when Chris approached me, I had not heard of Enteris. Uh, and then I suddenly find out they have this long history of actually making tissue and of having a special treatment for anti-calcification. Maybe you want to give us some comments because you've seen a, a whole array of different technologies for valve tissue. So in, in surgery, we use pericardium patch or pericardium in many places. I think the commonest two places you can associate easily with is one is RVOT patch or in pulmonic side. And many times it's not just the patch, you can make a unicuspid valve as well. And the second, which is now very common, is root enlargement. And in both these sides, one of the things we learn is when we reoperate is these can become calcified. And then they pose a big hazard in terms of managing it at that point. And that is the reason uh, this particular tissue technology has been used on the pulmonic side in over 50,000 patients and has shown hardly any calcification. So. Although one may say that it's less dynamic at that point, but the duration it has been used is long. And that, I think, points us that this anti-calcification works. And I, I, I was going to toss it to Anita, because I mean, I think your comment, Mike, about the Ross procedure, and I know, Anita, you have experience with a lot with that from your center and the MRI perspective. And, and I mean, do you think that's, I mean, as we've talked about biomedic and the benchmarks, I mean, what do you think when you've seen this valve, obviously, in use in your own practice, and the importance of trying to, you know, have a percutaneous Ross, essentially, procedure, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the ROS is really the gold standard, and so we have quite a large population of those patients. We do a lot of um, adult congenitals, so a lot of these young bicuspid patients that are getting ROS procedures. You know, one of the things we've seen on, on CMR is how the, you know, the dynamics or the hemodynamics of these valves are, are essentially like a native valve, yeah. you know, and I think that is the gold standard. That's what we're all looking for, to replace a valve with a valve that behaves like your own. Um, and, and Joelle's going to talk to us a lot about what he's seen in CMR, but I, I think it's really exciting times for patients who are going to need aortic valve replacement. By the, by the way, what is the importance of the coaptation length? Because it was clear from, from your slides that you see the, there's a longer co coaptation length with this technology. Is this something relevant, or is this a trivial this, finding? If you go back to, to aortic valve repair, valve sparing roots, one of the things that they teach early on is that your valve should look like a pair of praying hands with the heel of your palm at or above the annulus and with at least eight millimeters of fingers touching. And, and the more, more coaptation, not only does it relieve the stress, but it gives you more leeway if it starts to expand in any way to prevent AI as, as time goes on. So if you look at this, that was over eight millimeters. And if you looked at the heel of the praying hands, they're above the annulus. Those are exactly what we look for after aortic valve repair. So, so what is a typical coaptation length? Yeah, so 8.4 millimeters has been the main. 8.4. 8.4, yeah, which a normal transcatheter or surgical valve is usually just a couple millimeters yeah, in length. Three, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what struck me today as well is that our terminology when it comes to TAVA has changed. I mean, we never spoke about coaptation length for over mm -hmm. 20 years, right? Yeah. So now we're talking about coaptation length. And the other topic or the other ter new terminology that we're talking a lot more that you mentioned is pinwheeling. Um, Sushil, how important is pinwheeling? Maybe you want to explain what pinwheeling is for the, for the audience and how important it is. Sure. So, I mean, I think when we talk about a, a lot of extra tissue, we're always worried that the valve won't expand. And, and so the if you have an underexpanded valve, uh, it's a tri-leaflet valve, and you're going to see pinwheeling where the leaflets are, are sort of rotated as they close. And, and whether that's going to lead to leaflet thrombosis or uh, early degeneration has always been a concern. That's especially in a lot of these terms came up when we're doing valve and valve with uh, 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 sapiens in, in, in uh, prior surgical valves where you're not fully expanding the valve. And, and the in engineers have, from, have always taught us that, you know, to get a proper hemodynamics, in not only just opening but closing, you have to, you know, fully expand the valve. And I, and I think part of the challenge is that, you know, in, in a lot of these, you know, it's not, we have three sizes and the ranges are broad that you implant these sizes in. So you, you don't fully expand a valve because you, the anatomy is going to limit you or you're going to injure the root, whereas in surgery they're taking it out. We're sort of limited by the anatomy. And so when the first time I saw this, I actually was worried about it because my notion of redundant tissue and, and extra coaptation, I was worried that that's not the, the right approach. And I know what Mike is saying, and this is more like you see the closing, it's, it's the coaptation, but it's not rotating or, or pinwheeling. 
Yeah. And I think it's a great point because what we've seen is that on the bench studies that unlike most valves that you have like a one to two millimeter sweet spot from a size perspective, there's no pinwheeling around six to seven millimeters in size because these praying hands stop the valve from rotating on each other because it's like a blanket holding it straight up. So one last question before we move to the next one. Azim, I mean, you use all sorts of valves all the time. I mean, where is this need uh, or where are the trade-offs today and what, what is the need still in the space? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes we wonder why do we need so many valves, but I, I think we do. And I think that that need is becoming more and more apparent as we start treating patients who are younger with longer life expectancies. Our our standard of what we'll accept in a young patient is just has, has to be very high. It has to be as good as when Vinny and Mike put in a surgical valve. Mm. We have to be able to give patients, without exception, you know, low pacemaker rates, no PVL. But more importantly is we need to start, as we talk about this lifetime management, it shouldn't be only about, oh, what type of valve we're going to put in when that fails. We need to start talking about can we choose a valve and find a valve that's going to last the patient even longer so maybe we don't have to worry about what's the second or third valve down the road. And to me, I think that's the part I'm, I'm most interested in is can we find a valve for a younger patient that's going to last them as long as possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, Sushil, do you want to take it next? So Cecil did a cool uh, life case earlier today and a bicuspid valve, but uh, he, he was still uh, relying on TE guidance. What, what's the story about that? I, I, I don't do an, any echo anymore. Because we, we, we focus on excellent results. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Oh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Patient-centered care, <laughs> not physician-centered. Sorry. Um, all right, so um, moving on, thank you very much. Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure to sort of present the, some of the initial experience with the Doravar system. These are my disclosures, most relevant. I, as a consultant for Antares, and did some of the uh, first cases uh, uh, with the device with Chris and the rest of the team. Um, so, you know, Doravar has a reasonable experience. It's over 50 patients, 56 patients. Uh, the first in human experience outside the U.S. was uh, 41 patients and a U.S. EFS study of 15 patients. These were single-arm studies. And just to get the initial experience, understand the, the uh, sort of the system and get some safety and feasibility of this and allow us to iterate the system during this process. And I think that's what EFS is for. And I think we, we've iterated this device from the first in human and the way the balloon works, the way the device tracks, all the different components, because we learned during the course of an EFS, which is what, what really was important. And, and I think that's sort of the feedback that I think was important for me. And that was sort of to be a Chris's point that we're, there was a team that was sort of giving feedback and the engineers were trying to make those changes was, is really quite relevant. Um, and then there are core labs to look at sort of the obvious important endpoints with uh, transthoracic echo, CT, CMR, and try to really understand, is there differences? How can we optimize this further? Uh, and obviously, there will be ongoing follow-up. The, the outside the U.S. is just one year, but the EFS is uh, out to 10 years. Uh, you see the sort of the baseline demographics is just a limited demographics. What, you know, they were sort of intermediate to higher risk patients. Um, you know, the SDSs were three in the first in human and 5.8 in the EFS. Uh, important to note, the area derived annular diameter uh, was under 23. It was 20, roughly in the low 22s. That's because right now there was a, at this time there's only one valve size and, and that sort of dictated obviously some of the, uh, the sizing. So that's why you see most of the experience and when you look at the gradients and you look at the hemodynamics, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and you see the typical sort of risk factors that we see in TAVR patients. I think Chris mentioned this a bit. Um, you know, it, it's a balloon expandable valve. It's sort of what we're familiar with. Um, but the balloon is different. It, it has been iterated. Uh, to provide stability, um, and part of it is, and we're going to talk here, is there's there's commissure alignment with this device. There's a knob in the back that allows you to to rotate to get commissure alignment. But one one of the challenges that we noticed in the in initial EFS is, whenever when we first the first iteration of the device, when you rotated, you you inflated, it was somewhat unpredictable. You you lined it up. But as you inflated, the balloon characteristics or the valve would rotate. And so you didn't end up where you, where you thought you were. And that's where there's been a lot of time spent on the balloon, uh, that, you, the, that, is now that the valve is stable now in terms of its rotation as you inflate. 
Um, it's a steerable catheter, single you know single direction steering to help you navigate the arch. And then the, there's a 14 French uh, expandable sheath now uh, to help with the vascular access. Um, this is typical what you see. It's a 14 French, um, but it, you know th these are these are what I, as a physician I you know they seem very simple and it would be frustrating why things didn't work. And um, it, you know it seems like. You know, we've been used to the e-sheath for a long time. I know there's with the ice leave and things, and uh, there are challenges with this, and it took some time. But, uh, you know, the initial cases were done through much larger sheaths, either a 22 French Gore or uh, other various commercial sheaths. So, it, you know, it had to iterate down, but now it's through a 14 French e-sheath. Um, you see here there is a uh, there's flexion typical to what we see with the current balloon ex with the Edwards balloon expandable system, um, it, but the valve is crimped on the balloon. Um, there's no uh, you know there's no withdrawing the balloon. The valve is crimped onto the balloon, and, and the balloon is different. It's got these, uh, and I think that that was part, a lot of the engineering. And you know I'm not I, I can't really ex explain it. Well, part of the characteristics was you needed to be able to be reliably crimp at the same spot and you wanted the balloon to expand reliably. Because I think we learned from the early partner days uh, that it, there was a lot of asymmetric expansion of the balloon. And when you get asymmetric expansion of the balloon, you see motion of the valve up or down uh, and uh, during deployment. And I think that's one of the concerns. So you wanted a, a, you know, like a dog bone type of expansion, which helps stabilize the valve during deployment and that they were reliable sh for shortening. Because part of the, the simplicity of balloon expandable is you put it in the position you want, you inflate the balloon, and it, it, it sort of locks into where you want it to be. But if, if the balloon characteristics aren't optimized, that won't happen. I think there was, there was a lot of learnings. And you know, from early iterations of the balloon to where we are now is quite different. As I said, part of it is about the rotational characteristics as well. So then uh, you, you, you use these tabs, uh, these sort of figure. I don't know if I can point here. Uh, you can, when you rotate the back handle, you, you based on CT uh, and by your initial angiogram, you know where the where the commissures are, where the coronaries are. Um, and again, we can talk about commissural alignment or alignment to coronaries. Obviously, it's very different. When you're doing bicuspid valve, do you align to what commissure or do you align to a coronary? I think for a lot of us, what we're talking about with commissural alignment is coronary access. So we tend to more align to coronaries, but you can rotate. Uh, and you and you align these in a manner that you, when as the valve inflates, you'll get uh, com uh, commissural or coronary alignment. And then uh, again, I'll let this play a few times. And what you see, and and, I'll, and we'll let it play the first time. And what you want is, and what you see sometimes is frustrating is as you're starting to inflate, you see the balloon sort of slide on the valve. Um, and what we wanted to do was avoid that. And there are these stoppers here that are um, night and all. Um, that hold the valve in place, but I, the easiest way to look at it is look at this marker, and it, the, the valve stays very s stable on the balloon during deployment. Um, and, and obviously this is one case, but at the experience uh, more recently has been that with multiple cases, th this is this is what happens, and I think that's an important feature. And I guess yeah. you know over, you're gonna have to learn that over you know hundreds uh, of times in cases. I think the other thing I'd add on that one, Shaquille, is I mean I, this is in the right left of you, and so you can the, the commissural post or on the yeah. uh, outer curve there, the two overlapping ones, and then you have one that you don't see on the inner curve, over here. Uh, right? And so I think what's important to recognize is, like you said, it, it doesn't rotate, and that was a lot of work to do that, but you, you see this goes straight out. And also it's probably nice is the commissural post actually stay in place during inflation as well. So actually for valve and valves, actually did a tab and tab and tab uh, recently. And, um, you know, you can use the commissural post to put it on node five pretty easily uh, and identify your spot as well. Yeah, and I think that's the feature that, you know, the first, I remember in the beginning, the cases that we did, you know, this, these would rotate and it wouldn't stay stable. Mm -hmm. And I think this was, this took some time. And it's really about balloon characteristics, yeah. right? You can align, but if the balloon is going to rotate, uh, it, 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 the valve as it inflates, that's obviously a, a challenge. So uh, real quick, these are the initial safety uh, results. Um, you know, the, from a primary safety endpoint, uh, there was one mortality in the EFS uh, uh, data. Um, and then you look at the other events, uh, one stroke, um, pacemaker rates um, uh, in the initial first in human around 5%, typical we see with balloon expandable, no pacers in the initial U.S. experience. Uh, there were some vascular complications early on. And again, as I said, early on we used the 22 French gore sheath. Um, and, and so it's, you know, the, 
uh, obviously plays a role in some of it. Um, and the, the rest of the events you see here are pre pretty low and pretty typical what they see with current commercial experience. And then there's been a lot of talk about hemodynamics, and obviously that's been the main focus. And so this is, again, a, a valve in a mean annular size of about 22 millimeters. You, you get EOAs of 2.2. Uh, mean gradients of eight. And what's important is I, I've started to focus a lot more on DVI. And this DVI is a lot, 0.6 is, is a lot more than we typically see. We typically see DVI is 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0 0.45. Uh, but th th this is quite remarkable. And again, it m measured to the hemodynamics. You see here again, this core lab data, the uh, DVIs as well as the valve areas. Consistent valve areas over two uh, with this valve for this uh, annular size, and the mean gradients less than 10, around eight to nine uh, that stayed consistent. This is the initial first in human experience. This is the data for the, um, the, the US EFS experience. And again, you see in this data, one, one pacemaker um, at 6.7, no other mortalities here that you saw. Then again, hemodynamics quite similar, reproducible 2.2, mean gradients around 7.5, and again, DVI is above 0.6. Um, no significant PVL. Uh, in the previous experience, again, no significant moderate PVL as well. Um, and again, you see the hemodynamics. Again, this is only 30-day data, but you see the results here. So, you know, this is initial data. It's 50 patients. There's been iteration of the, of the valve over the course of these first uh, 50 cases. Uh, in terms of not only the valve, not the valve as much, but the delivery system to get these consistent results. The hemodynamics has been excellent with a single valve size. Um, it's a you know predictable balloon expandable delivery system, um, and the the global pivotal trial is <coughs> going to be starting next year, and so we'll get get some data in, in comparison to existing valves and see how it performs. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Anita, I mean, you want to comment? I mean, you've used it now quite a few times in valve and valve, and um, just talk about the ease of use because I think it's a you know we're all busy operators, and maybe a lot of people who come to these meetings are very experienced in Taver, uh, but I think it's important to make sure the technologies as they translate are pretty intuitive. I mean, what was your experience? Yeah, so we've done five cases. We're going to be presenting our data tomorrow in a session, so I encourage you to, to come see that. You know, essentially, we decided to do these cases under special access for particular reasons for these patients. So they were patients who didn't have bypass grafts, even though they had an AVR, um, and they had cons we had concerns about leaving them with high gradients, and so we chose Duravar. And so, you know, we had never done a case when we did our first valve and valve in July of last year. It's very intuitive. I mean, it's like the technology that we already know how to use. The commissural alignment was easy, and that was sort of the earlier generation that we did on our first case. And so I think it really does utilize the skills that you already have and the knowledge that you already have to be able to, to deploy a valve. It, I think crossing the valve was hard in a couple of our cases, more than actually putting the valve in place because the gradients were so high. Yeah. But um, you know, it's it's easy to use. I mean, there's nothing, you know, very yeah. foreign about this at all. And Vinny, you've been in a ton of the cases now, I think as many as me almost. I mean, the last time we did, what, 13, 12, 13, just uh, last month, and I mean, we were flying through. I mean, what, were, what was your experience? I think uh, Sushil highlighted the changes, which is important. Um, you know, any new device you start, device delivery system, both have to be, uh, you know, married together well as well. And the last trip was phenomenal in terms of seeing the changes, not just on the second generation valve, but the delivery system and the sheath. Yeah. And hence the procedure has become very streamlined now. And uh, again, the duration of the procedure, despite you know multiple checklists is um, really short. So as Anita said here, it's something which we already do, a balloon expandable, it's no different anymore. Is, is pre-dill mandatory? No. 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 Not you don't right. need a pre -dull. And I think I would congratulate the engineers on that. I would say yeah. that uh, the features of the nose cone and the delivery, the catheter and the balloon is such that the pre in in a very horizontal bicuspid like anatomy calcified, it's still easy to cross. Yeah. So I think it's interesting. So a few of us have spent years on calls talking through this and, you know, a lot of times we do a lot of things in practice and we think we understand how things work and why they work. But then when you dig deeper on the engineering side, you realize maybe you didn't really understand it the way you thought. So one thing that we spent a lot of time was on the, the nose cone, actually, in distal stop. And actually, interestingly, 
the first time they mentioned to me, can we have a tightly woven nitinol distal stop? I was like, why would we use nitinol to hold something in place? It's, you know, and it's actually quite fascinating because the way it works is unbelievable. I mean, it lets you smooth out your frame as you're crossing the arch. It lets you have just enough give as you actually are crossing the valve. And as you're actually pushing through the expandable sheath, it really allows you to track those contours a bit easier as well. So I think credit to them that they have done a great job really getting a creative solution to some of the things we see clinically. Well, and the other important feature and that seems um, simple, but it isn't, is the short the short stand frame. Yeah. So I, I am very much in favor of avoiding stand frames in front of the coronaries. And uh, Sushil already mentioned commissural alignment or coronary alignment. But basically, if you have a short stand frame, you don't need to bother about a coronary alignment. You just want to focus on commissural alignment because that might affect your hemodynamic valve performance. Mm -hmm. So, um, so then you don't need to uh, make any concessions in terms of your commissural alignment. If you have a stand frame in front of the coronaries, that's where you may want to opt for coronary alignment to make sure that you that you will be able to reaccess the yeah. coronaries if needed. So, I think that is also uh, an an important, very simple, but very important feature of the valve. I, I do think, <coughs> sorry. No, yeah, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, when you're doing this size valve in these annuli, even balloon expandable is going to be to the sinus in many. And that's where I think the coronary alignment in a large open cell, I think, is valuable. So I think that the top cells are open because the, the it's a short frame, but when, you, when you're doing 26 and 29 valves, you often are below the coronaries. But I would say a lot of these, especially in women, all these 23 valves, uh, you end up above the coronary. So getting the alignment and getting the, having a large open cell for coronary access, I think, is important. And, you know, the next generation is going to be through. This right now is a little bit taller than a 23 sapien. And the next generation is going to be, I think, three or four millimeters shorter. So it's going to be comparable to the yeah, current. No, no, now it is. The new generation yeah. is actually now, yeah. yeah. But, but when you talk about commissure and coronary alignment, you've got to remember that even if you have a bicuspid with 180 coronaries, coronaries are never behind the commissure. They can't be. Mm -hmm. They can be above it. Yeah. They can be to the side of it. Yeah. And so if, unless, it, unless your post goes above your normal commissure, no matter how your coronaries are, if you line up post to post, your coronaries are going to be okay. Yeah, and I, I think it's a great point. I know I, I think I saw Roxanne in here earlier, and I know Mike's here from the SMART trial data and looking at, I think we talked about annual size and looking at some of the hemodynamic results. Azeem, I mean, you've, I've, I've seen you talk on this before, but I mean, you know, this really, I think, goes back to a different class because we've just talked about the short frame, right? And we've consistently seen your short frames or balloon expandables that we are compromising in hemodynamics. Maybe there's some mild improvement now, but still not normalization of hemos. And it seems like now, at least with this design, that we're able to really get to evolute, if not better, hemodynamic performance. But what is kind of your thoughts looking at that compared to maybe some of the smart data? I guess what I take away when I look at all this data is that we all have to accept that not all valves are created equally, that not all Tava valves are the same, not so all self-expandable valves give you the same hemodynamics or can be um, put in the same class. And similarly with balloon expandable valves, we're now coming into a world where I think in the next few years, we'll see here in the United States multiple balloon expandable valves. And because we deploy it on a balloon doesn't mean they're all the same. And I think that's gonna be really the important discussion, right? Is what are the differences between different technologies? And it's going to come to, because I think when you talk about balloon expandable, ease of use and reproducibility are really the gold standard and why many people like the valve. Then it's gonna come down to frame height, do you have commercial alignment? How reliable the commercial alignment is? What is your tissue made of? And how long that's going to last? And because, you know, not all of us are going to be here 20 years from now um, still doing valves, you also want to look at are there any early changes as regards to hemodynamics, gradients, valve areas, and maybe some unique features that Ja will tell us about later that we'll be able to say maybe one valve has some advantages over another valve. Um, so I think you know this area is still um, a very important and wide open area, and I'm I'm glad Smart came out because it's forcing us to to address the fact and talk about the fact that we can't use one valve in every patient, every anatomy. That certain valves do better, and that there are other factors that are important to our patients uh, in making a choice. And so we're going to have to get better at choosing the right valve for the right patient. Yeah, no, absolutely.
Mike. You ready? I think it's up to you now. Well, I know a lot of the people in this room, but for, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael Reardon. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Houston, and I've been doing cardiac surgery for a little over 40 years now. And, and, I, and my clinical and research interest has been cardiac valve disease, particularly aortic valve disease. And so I've been very interested in hemodynamics and why hemodynamics matter. We already mentioned earlier that the Ross procedure is the only thing that gets you back to a normal uh, lifespan because it, it mimics your real aortic valve. And the closer you get, the longer you're going to live. We have lots of growing data that any level of aortic stenosis, even mild, shortens your life. The ECHO database from, from Australia shows us that. So we really want to get back to, to as close to normal as we can. And you've already seen this, uh, this uh, slide. Uh, Shashil showed you this. So if you look at the first in man and the EFS, so EOAs, 2.20, uh, 2.18, both very good. The problem with EOA is it's fraught with errors because of measurement. In fact, when we started core valve, my echo lab would not even give you an EOA for a surgical valve because measuring the LVOT was so hard. They'd only give you a DVI because that's the only thing they thought was, was accurate. And in fact, if you look at the literature and you read two different studies with the same valves, one have an EOA of 1.8 and one have an EOA of 2 because they're read by different core labs. In fact, we've looked at echo core lab versus sites for the Paragon trial, and, and one of the things that doesn't correlate is EOA. EOA is fraught with error. Mean gradient. Mean gradients do correlate between echo core labs and sites. The problem is they're flow dependent. And so if you don't know the flow, you don't know. One thing that's independent of both of those is Doppler velocity index, DVI. So why is DVI important? Well, DVI is important because it just comes from the continuity equation that flow below the valve equals flow at the tip of the, the opening of the valve, the EOA. And the flow below the valve is the LVOT area times the LVOT velocity times index, that envelope you see on echo that summarizes all instantaneous velocities across systole. And that equals the EOA, the aortic valve opening, times the aortic velocity times index. You don't have to measure any links for your LVOT. You're not going to lose by the square there because you don't measure. You're just measuring VTIs, and VTIs are pretty easy to measure. So if you divide the LVOT VTI by the aortic VTI, what that equals, that Doppler velocity index, is the ratio of that individual patient's effective orifice area to that individual patient's left uh, LVOT area at that individual patient's flow. So it's normalized to flow and it's normalized to, to, to size. Why? Because little people have little LVOTs and big people have big LVOTs. So if you go back and you look at like Becky Hahn's work, you'll see that no matter what valve size, the DVI is the same because it's not an actual number for the OA, it's a percentage of the OA to the LVOT. And of course, you'd like to be as close to one as you possibly can get. So if you look at DVIs here, Duravar 0.64, Evolute 0.61, that comes from Becky Hahn's work when Becky went back and looked at the core lab echoes in the uh, Evolute uh, uh, trials and the partner trials, and Sapien 3 was 0.42. So that's 64% of that patient's LVOT, 61% of that patient's LVOT, or 42% of that patient's LVOT. In the Evolute trials, when we did this, I went back and looked at the mean surgical. Mean surgical was 0.5. And, and that's why I think when you looked at the Evolute trial, the durability turned out to be better and the survival turned out to be better because it's clearly better hemodynamics. Now, we've talked about this coaptation length. If you look at this, again, I, I tell you, when, when you look at this, we know from aortic valve repair, because we do a lot of those now, that you want to see your, your praying hands, the heel of your hands, at or above the annulus, and you'd like to see at least eight millimeters of coaptation. That cooptation allows you to even overexpand the valve without developing AI. It spreads the stress out across that, and it does, ca not, does not cause you to pinwheel. Pinwheel is the length of the leaflet, not the amount of, of cooptation you have. What this does is reduce stress, and it should make it last longer. And because of the way it's folded, Chris has already shown you that it opens up better. It opens up in a better fashion, and it opens up more fully. And that's why you're seeing the DVIs that, that we're seeing. Now, there's really no pinwheeling. I'm not going to go over this again. You've already seen this once. But pinwheeling, so I, I'm grateful for pinwheeling because when I was a young surgeon, there was a valve called the INSQ Shiley. Everybody but maybe Eberhard is too young, too old, too young to know this. But it was one of the first <laughs> tissue valves ever, I don't remember, because we're, we're getting up there. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a tissue valve, and it failed. Why? Because they put in these very long leaflets to try to prevent leakage, and they pinwheeled, and they all failed. And so I spent a lot of my early surgical career taking out INSQ Shiley valves. And people learn from that that pinwheeling is a bad thing because the leaflets lengthwise fold on themselves and they twist and they fail because that creates stress points. Now we also see with this valve, and I'm not going to say much about this because this is really going to be for Giles to talk about, it's more laminar flow. Laminar flow is crucial. 
Anytime you get turbulent flow, you lose energy. And what the heart cares about is how much work it has to do to get the blood out of the heart and around the body. And work is, is force times distance and force is mass times acceleration. And if you get laminar flow, there's less energy expended getting that blood forward than if you have chaotic flow. Now you can measure this with echo because in, in laminar flow, the velocity changes from the wall to the midstream, whereas in turbulent flow, the mean's the same across there. But you're losing energy. You can do this with echo, but it's much better done with, with CMR, and I'll, I'll let Jal comment on that. But I do think that when, we, when you look at this, and one of the things that we're starting to look at as a field is not just how big the valve opens, but how does the blood flow across the valve? And laminar flow is one of the key things, and that's one reason why tissue valves, in some ways, are a little bit better than some of the older mechanical valves we had that had single disc, because those single discs cause very turbulent flow, where central openings start to lend themselves to laminar flow, but not all of them end up laminar. And, and again, this is just an echo show. I'm, I'm going to skip over this. You can do this with echo. It's not really the way to do it. The real way to do it is do it with 4D CMR, and it, it, it shows it very nicely. So hemodynamic performance matters. Hemodynamics affect your survival. Hemodynamics affect your ability to recover and do what you want to do. We know that severe patient prostatic mismatch impedes your ability to exercise. It, and, the, and the smaller your valve, the smaller your EOA, the harder you're going to have doing the things you want to do, particularly as you move to younger, more active patients. And DVI really is the metric I think we ought to all be looking at. I mean, it's much more important than EOA, which is fraught with errors. It's much more important than mean gradients, which are important, but they're all flow dependent, whereas this is independent of flow and independent of patient size. And it gives you a good valve-to-valve, patient-to-patient metric to look at. Pinwheel and co-optation link can also be seen in echo. These are really early signs of what I think are going to be increased durability, things that we know of from aortic valve repair. And laminar flow can be seen on echo through all levels of the valve, and it may explain some of the hemodynamic performance. You, when you look at the CMRs, you'll really see this. You look at a normal valve, and you look at a dura valve, and what you see is you get the same type of laminar flow. And again, the closer you can get to the valve God gave you when it was working, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop there, and we'll move on uh, to either questions well, or the next one. Well said, Mike. I think for the sake of wanting to have more conversation, thank you. Uh, let's jump to Joao because he's going to build on that in the flow perspective, and then we can really kind of settle in on some of these other uh, clinically relevant differences. Well, thank you so much, Chris uh, and, and Terrace, for this opportunity. Presenting here work that is uh, being done by a colleague as well, Pankaj Garg, uh, from uh, Norwich in UK as well, that helps us uh, tremendously in the development of this. Uh, some disclosures that get consulting from Enteris. So set the stage that aortic valve, we're talking about the aortic stenosis, but this is not just a disease of obviously the valve, it's the disease of the valve of the ventricle and of the arteries. We're talking about arteries too, yes. So in a patient with severe aortic stenosis, obviously there has to be some compensatory uh, increase in the wall thickness to accommodate the increased wall stress. And by doing that, it comes at the expense of obviously having fibrosis scar that you see here by late get. After you do AVR, provided that there is no prosthesis patient mismatch and there is good control of hypertension, and you have a healthy arteries, you're going to regress this hypertrophy. You're going to regress even some of the interstitial expansion, which is by the collagen that we can measure by MRI. So a good artery Good arteries should be pulsatile. They should be able to accommodate the blood flow. And in diastole, they should continue to propagate that flow. So that perfusion continues in diastole as well. So what happens with the aortic stenosis? <clears throat> Normal aortic flow should be laminar. So the Vmax, the peak, the highest velocity, should be at the very center of the vessel, not touching the walls. And obviously, with the aortic stenosis, we're going to distort the blood flow. And so the flow gets erratic. It gets distorted. There's turbulence and there's going to be more wall shear stress because it's going to hit the wall of the arteries. Well, these arteries are not going to like, and eventually they're going to become stiff. And that stiffness is going to create, obviously, some reflection of these waves, and even in systole, it bounces in the wall, and it travels back again. So you're wasting energy, and this ventricle is wasting even more work. So it doesn't like that. So this is a non-laminar flow, and this is a non-laminar turbulent flow. Is that true? Well, this has been done with the 4D flow MRI. As you can see from healthy here, the bullseye, it starts to move into the periphery as we get more stenotic, different groups of patients. 
In some other concepts, they are going to be important. How far are you from the center? That's called the displacement ratio, the distance from the centroid of the vessel. And this systolic flow reversal ratio, that is that reflection that comes back even in systole. So it's that turnaround because of the reflection of the waves. Well, there's an easy solution. Let's fix the valve. We tried that. We drew that with surgery. And this is some work that we had done together with the group at Penn, pre and post uh, cardiac MRI. And it turns out that actually after you fix the aortic valve with surgery, you increase your aortic stiffness. Maybe you are unmasking because now the ventricle is talking directly with the arteries. There is no more impeding force like the aortic valve. So the compliance goes down, the stiffness goes up, and this reflection, which is that counter talk between the ventricle and the arteries, the pushback, is called the reflection magnitude was inversely correlated with KCCQ. That is, the patients that had the highest reflection of the magnitude had the worst KCCQ improvement, and that was seen. Well, surgery did not work. How about TAVR? Let's go to TAVR. All right. So we do this looking at 4D flow, severe aortic stenosis. With 4D flow MRI, you can see that the flow is quite not laminar. It's eccentric. It's turbulent. It hits the outer curvature. You put a sapien here, but you could say it could be other valve, it could be a surgical valve as well, and you still have not restored laminar flow. That is a cross-section of the aorta, looking at exactly that flow displacement at 10 o'clock. Ideally, you'd like to have the flow down the center, right? Well, we have learned through this publication from uh, Philippe Genero, looking at the changes of aortic stage, and now we're fixing this either with surgery or with TAVR there's not a significant improvement. You improve, obviously, some of the symptoms, but the changes of the heart that should occur within a one-year time span did not happen. Only 15% had improvement. It's pretty much a lateral move for most patients, and some of them worsening. Is that because are we too simplistic to think that one valve would fix everything? Are we doing a small benefit to these patients? Is that because there could be some other culprits? And one of them here that unfortunately is covered is hypertension as well that it was one of the causes of lack of cardiac stage improvement. And that is that, again, importance of flow that might be uh, related to that. When we look into both surgical and TAVR valves, again, for 4D flow, central flow is normal with mild eccentricity, severe eccentricity. This is in balloon expandable valves. We could see that whether we look at surgery or TAVR, we could see that eccentricity seems to be even greater with TAVR devices and greater flow displacement. And that might have also some implications into increasing while she is stressed, as we talked about, continuation of hypertension, amplification of that, and increase uh, while she is stressed. So is there a way that we could do this without causing a compromise to the arteries. So we took this work um, at the Republic of Georgia, and I want to, again, give kudos to Pankaj Gar, good friend and colleague, who, uh, working together with the group there, has been able to apply not only 2D phase contrast, as you see here, but even 4D flow, as we have now. Looking at the post-CMR flow pattern of Durovar. So this is a normal healthy valve. There's no AS. As you can see, systole comes, it fills out nicely here the cross section of the order. Flow displacement is minimal, and the flow reversal ratio is pretty much minimal. Here, five patients are Duravar. You can see again, same laminar flow. Contrast now, obviously, with severe AS. That's how they would start with before they got into the Duravar. You see this very displaced flow. With Sapien, you can see the same magnitude, uh, not too different from actually severe AS. Um, that's from the full perspective. Evolute, we can see also some flow displacement and even surgical valves here with Edwards Magna Ease. So there was no significant difference between what you see post TAVR with this device versus even a normal healthy aortic valve. So restoration of potentially normal flow, which might have downstream implications to the valve, to the ventricle, and to the arteries. Now, looking at this biomimetic design, again, just put into bar graphs, this uh, flow displacement, comparing uh, healthy aortic valves with Duravar and other competitors, you can see that there's greater displacement and greater reversal ratio with other devices versus what was seen with this biomimetic. But so 
we are talking about different languages and concepts and uh, really uh, lexicon here. We're talking about cooptation lamp. We're talking about how we can optimize the uh, delivery of this balloon expandable valve. And now introducing the flow. I think it's quite a lot. So let's actually dial back down and understand maybe that's great. You can show colors, but so what? Right? So, I mean, show me that there is actually some benefit beyond what these colors would show. So what is the impact of actually doing something after restoring flow to the ventricle? So we need to look at the left ventricle. And again, this is a construct that cardiac MRI is considered the gold standard for precise quantification. Here we have 12 paired patients pre and six months post. There is also some echo data obviously done by uh, Taver valves and uh, Brian Linden, who is here in the audience as well, looking at echo. But the precision of measurement of the echo is difficult because it relies on assumptions on the formulas. And a lot of that has to do with also the dimensions of the ventricle. But nonetheless, with MRI with 12 patients, we could see here that there is an important LV mass regression, which ultimately speaks for how did you unload that ventricle and also improvement on left mass index as well by 29%. And if you can do this delta here, you can see that it's almost 20 points. Whereas, you know, in this recent meta-analysis that was published, nine publications, 246 patients, the average left mass regression was about 15. Of course, we're talking about one valve size versus a, a cross of the spectrum. But needless to say that that benefit that was seen with also the gradients and the echo DVI that was presented by Dr. Reardon and others might have also some implications into the ventricle. And we are very excited to see also the continuation of this data now here in the US. This is the data from the EFS. Um, there was uh, 15 patients and uh, we have cardiac MRI in a handful of them. Uh, this is to be expanded now. We can see this pre and post uh, cardiac MRI. There is improvement of the global longitudinal strain. The ejection fracture is already super good, so we cannot make it better. You could make it worse, but did not get worse. But you can make strain better. You can make the RV strain better. Mm -hmm. You can make also left ventricular mass substantially reduced. And more importantly, again, the restoration of the flow. As you can see, the red column of blood is the red down center, uh, which um, was, again, something that we have restored from this obviously severe aortic stenotic turbulent flow. So my final thoughts is that, you know, in the post ever imaging analysis that we have seen so far, demonstrates that this long coaptation length, um, similar to a native aortic valve, might have some very favorable benefits, not only from echo gradients, but also high OA and DVI. There is some very favorable early reverse remodeling that now has been seen by cardiac MRI, and obviously, importantly, the restoration of this normal lamina flow. And Obviously, the jury is still out whether these uh, findings would have, obviously, some downstream impact into LV remodeling arterial stiffness that will be um, prospectively evaluated now with the ongoing future studies and also the pivotal sub-study. Thank you. Provocative stuff, Joao. Thank you. Um, thoughts from anybody? Uh, Amy, any comments? Well, I, I just want to say one thing. But I mean, I've been doing this a long time. You know, we've always relied on echo, and I have nothing against echo. But you know, the mass regression on echo is is fraught with errors because of the formula. MRI is is to me the gold standard, and and, and the use of MRI for for laminar flow, for for extracellular expansion early on, for mid wall fibrosis. And we're learning so much about this that really affects. I think the, the, the early signs of what's going to happen long term to these patients clinically, which we never really thought about before. And, and I think imaging is, is really helping to drive this forward. And I think the things that Jao just showed you are all markers for something that, that you're getting more heart recovery. You're going to end up with less fibrosis as long as you do it early enough. And, and the heart's going to be having to, to deal with less work. Now, one comment about why after aortic valve replacement, your aortic walls are stiffer. I put a big cut on it and I sew it up. Yeah. You know, that makes it very stiff. <laughs> yep. So, so obviously, I haven't done it for such a long time, but um, I'm also very impressed with the MRI data. Is, is this going to be incorporated in the next trial? Yeah, a great question. Yeah, uh, Joel. Yeah, so we are very fortunate. I mean, talking about differentiating also in the way that we take science and take that seriously from the very beginnings, you know, bringing everybody together. There was this impetus, you know, and thanks for listening because it's through those observations. If, you know, if it was known, 
you know, that's why we do research. We don't know the answers, right? So let's explore by cardiac MRI. You know, we were looking at, you know, how could we be much more precise in this uh, reverse remodeling early on. But then let's add flow because that might be quite unique as we start to see some of the preliminary echo data showing very high DVIs and very, um, you know, increased um, uh, valve areas. It's like there has to be some crosstalk between the ventricle yeah. and the arteries that we need to explore. Yeah, but, but, but there are quite some logistic challenges of with course. implementing an MRI study. So is, is, it, is it the ambition to incorporate that in a in In a sub-study, yeah. So in a sub-study from the pivotal trial, there will be obviously selected size that will be okay. trained, yeah. uh, that will be able to do 4D flow MRI. Um, but that's the beauty of a method like that that is precise. You don't need a huge number of mm. patients to yeah, show a difference because of the precision. I'm building out my fourth hybrid room that's going to have a 1.5 Tesla magnet attached to the room. I can literally take your, your, your lab bed, roll it in, because we'll have a non man A 1.5 Tesla is outdated. It's three yeah. Tesla these days. But, no, but actually, well, I have, I have a you don't want it to go. That'll suck you right in. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, you, you don't want it to go high Tesla, a high yeah, magnetic yeah. field, because yeah. that comes with more problems with artifacts. Yeah. So yeah. 1.5 is what we saw here. That's beautiful. That that delivers. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so can I I, you know, what's important is now Tavers established for 22 years. Every trial has taken us to the next level mm -hmm. uh, in terms of indication, in terms of flow. So I think this is probably the next level, right? Yeah. Is stop worrying just at fixation and function, but is it adequate function? Yeah. And I think that's going to help us a lot. If those of you remember old uh, campaigns in the U.S., it's the economy stupid, it's the flow stupid. <laughs> Everything is flow, and it's how you measure flow. And, and, that's, and when you look at how we treat these patients, the mantra should be, it's the flow stupid. So, Jean, uh, is there any long-term data correlating with this flow? I mean, I see the LV mass regression. Is there anything else out there? Or are we rewriting now how this is going to be done in the future? Yeah, there is some preliminary actually work on ROS uh, procedure. And 4D flow and ROS, that is the one that restores the nanomet flow. And, and showing and that for, it's and show that with better outcomes. Yes. Yeah. It actually, when you do a ROS procedure, you are able to restore complete lamina flow from a severely stenotic and, and you can show that on CMR. Yes. That's amazing. So, you know, whether this would have bad implications to unloading the ventricle, making some benefit to the arteries, and eventually durability. It's, that's why we're excited about what the future will show. We don't know yet. So, so maybe one more question to you and Chris, because when you show the different valves, and you guys at Minneapolis have also shown that with balloon expandable valves, valve expansion is important, right, for flow, for outcomes, for preventing halt. So that kind of flow we see, is it dependent on getting maximal expansion of the valve? And what impact is valve expansion going to have on flow? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a great question. That I, I will say from some of the things we've seen from our earlier learnings and now, I, I think it's there's probably some role of both, but I think the design of the leaflets themselves play a much bigger role than the frame expansion itself. Yeah, there, there's learning from the history of yeah. surgery. So we had a valve that we don't have anymore. It's called the Toronto stentless valve, and it was a subcoronary valve, and it was and it was pliable. So you could basically put any size valve in any size hole. And some of these valves came out and had a higher gradients much higher than you'd expected. And you went back and looked, and the surgeon put in a valve that was matched to a, a larger LVOT than the annulus. And so what happened is they had this extra tissue in there, and that leads to increased gradients, and it'll lead to pinwheeling. Again, pinwheeling is the length of the, of the leaflets. I mean, un, under-expanded valves of any type are bad. Yeah. Yeah, with under-expansion, obviously, comes more pinwheeling. Uh, even the, the, the suturing of the leaflets, you show on those very nice cinematic renderings that you could see that there is some real state that is lost by just the virtue of the commissure posts. These leaflets, they open completely and they open very freely. So that might have an implication of what we are seeing as the flow uh, measured by, by cardiac MRI. Is there a question? Is there a qu uh, yes, go ahead. Hello? Yes. yes. Hello. Okay. Hey. Good morning. I wanted to ask about uh, if Duravar has a good potential for uh, like aortic valve disease, rheumatic heart disease patients, especially young population, uh, because we were like designing a trial for uh, people who like patients who have rheumatic heart disease and they have their mitral uh, aortic valve affected, and you know most of them are women, and they want to they seek for pregnancy and Sadly, if they made open heart surgery, warfarin is teratogenic. So we were like seeking for giving them an alternative option. 
So we we had the choice on uh, Evola, uh, Evolut, yeah. And so I'm just asking you: Do you think Duravar is, has a good potential for this? Are we talking about young women that want to have children and 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 because yes. because these don't no, no matter because no matter what kind of valve we put in this tissue it's going to fail mm -hmm. and it's nothing but a bridge to either a mechanical or a ROS. So the only thing you can put in that's not going to fail is a ROS. I don't care what tissue valve. A young woman, it, particularly in the mitral position, is worse. But these, when we look at these, these are all bridges to allow you to have children to some eventual other procedure. Which is that's not such a bad idea in yeah. these countries, right? Yeah. Because then maybe you take the 24-year-old to 34, and she's had her two kids, and then she gets some no, mechanical so some, valve. So some of the polymerage right. valves are now being tested yeah. over in India in young women who have mitral valve disease who need to have children. And if those valves last even five years, that's going to be a real plus because the, 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 they, a mitral and a young woman wears out in, in no time at all. But yeah. having said that, this is very important. And this has been already done with other devices. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think in childbearing age group, means I've operated in Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, is they still opt for surgical valves which are bioprosthetic. So why not replace it with something which will give you equivalent or maybe even more durability. Yeah. Maybe it is five becomes eight, yeah. mm -hmm. or maybe eight yeah. becomes 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think this is going to be an important conversation going ahead. And all these patients are small annuli. Yeah. So let's not forget that either. Yeah. So yeah. as a surgeon, I don't want to do root enlargement in a 20 year old. I would rather, you know, reoperate and that time do a mechanical. Yeah. So very, very good question. Yeah. 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 And yeah, congratulations on your study. That's yeah. very important yeah, yeah. for women's yeah, health. I want to ask out. another question, sorry. Yeah. Um, do you think that, about, apart from women, like men, for example, do you think that Jurava would be, like, stable in young uh, population? Because we know that in, like, young population, there is no enough time for calcification. So, like, there is no, like, I, I was amazed that it has secure deployment over the balloon. So I believe maybe it has a good potential. It would be life-changing in third world heart countries. Time will tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think we need to do the clinical yeah. studies and prove to the rest of you yeah. that uh, yeah. durability is good. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you, Thank you for the questions. So one last question as we're racking up, uh, just uh, back to Joao, and I think, you know, just summarizing things today, or maybe I'll just summarize instead of tossing your sure. question. But I think, first of all, thank you to everybody in the audience and really appreciate it. And thank you to the panel. I think the takeaway is that, you know, um, this valve, uh, with the credit to the people in the company, really decided to build something different, right? It wasn't just to make another bioprosthetic valve, but to mimic the native aortic valve. I think we've seen that, that was able to be done, not only do it, but do it with a really easy to use delivery system, and, uh, which is important. The clinical results are as good, if not better, than anything from a hemodynamic perspective. And further, I think there's really exciting evidence on the restoration of flow, uh, be it laminar flow. And Joao, I mean, congratulations. The LV mass regression is remarkable on MRI, and I think it's been really exciting to see where those things go. A lot of us will be helping, or uh, everybody here is going to be is heavily involved in the global pivotal trial. There are a few spots left actually for that. So if you're extremely eager and think you can crush it, uh, come find a few of us. But uh, it's almost uh, tapped out. So um, otherwise, thank you for coming today. And uh, we look forward to showing you more.